Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone. Welcome to the first episode of 2024. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. I hope you're all having a wonderful start to the new year. Before we dive into this week's episode, I'd like to mention A Weekend with Elizabeth I, a two-day online event exploring the life and reign of this iconic Tudor queen that's taking place on the weekend of the 17th and 18th of February. Enjoy talks by seven leading Tudor history experts, all from the comfort of your home. Participants will have access to all content for two months following the completion of the event, so there's plenty of time to catch up if you're unable to watch any of the lectures over the weekend. The stellar list of contributors includes Dr. Nicola Tallis, Professor Suzanne Doran, Dr. James Taff, Professor Carol Levin, Professor Maria Haywood, and Dr. Owen Emerson. To learn more and register your place, head to my website on thetudortrail.com or just Google A Weekend with Elizabeth I Event Bright. I do hope you'll consider joining us. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon community. Visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors Patreon family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to take part in a member-only book club and enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Rebecca Quas Moore to the show to discuss the Devonshire Manuscript and Women Writers in Tudor England. Rebecca is an Associate Professor of Early Modern British Literature at the University of Central Oklahoma. Their research focuses on gender in early modern literature and on demasculinizing literary historiographies. That is, on considering how we got to our current ideas about early modern culture and on working to restore women's places in the history of the period's literature. She has published work on early fictionalizations of Anne Boleyn in the Palgrave Handbook of Shakespeare's Queens, on early modern women's education in explorations in Renaissance culture, and on the political function of the English housewife in Appositions. Their forthcoming work includes articles on the early modern poet Isabella Whitney, on masculinity and madness in modern adaptations of Shakespeare, and on Perdita's restorative role in The Winter's Tale. Her monograph, Gender and Position Taking in Henrician Verse, Translation, Transcription and Tradition, is out now from Amsterdam University Press. Let's dive straight in. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Rebecca. How are you? Well, thank you so much for having me, Natalie. Yes, I've been so looking forward to our conversation. And perhaps we can just begin with you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Certainly, thank you. Um, So I am an associate professor of English at um, an institution called the University of Central Oklahoma. Oklahoma is quite a central state in the United States, and then we're very much at the center of that state. So I've been there for a little over five years now. Um, I completed my PhD at the University of Arkansas, which is next door geographically, in 2016. um, And that dissertation project did focus on Tudor court literature. So that's really where I live with a focus on poetry there. 
but an intersecting interest definitely in early modern gender and sexuality. So I have work out on women's education in the early modern world, on the sort of figure of the English housewife and her importance. Um, I have a bit on Shakespeare and Fletcher's portrayal of Anne Boleyn and Henry Henrique Shin historiography. And then also recently, um, I've been doing a bit more with Margaret Douglas, partly resulting from uh, work around my recent book, Gender and Position Taking in Henry Shin Verse, Tradition, Translation and Transcription. Wonderful. And we are actually here to speak a little bit about your latest book. So do you want to, just for our listeners to get an idea of what they can expect in your book, tell us just a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. Always very happy to talk about the book. So this is a case where uh, the literature has also really shaped my scholarly identity. So like a lot of people, I think, um, my interest in the Tudor period really was maybe more historical at first. Um, I always joke that I fell in love with Anne Boleyn when I was about five years old, um, and it just never changed. I did also really like early modern literature, maybe more than the average sort of kid or teenager, but like a lot of kids or teenagers, that was really more Shakespeare. I do think, though, that it was kind of a combination of not like fearing that Shakespearean sort of language, and then my interest in the Tudor court that led me to want to do early Tudor literature as I moved from undergrad to my graduate career. And that was where I encountered, it might have been Ray Seaman's work, it might have been Elizabeth Heal or Helen Barron, but someone talking about the Devonshire manuscript. And it answered this not quite question for me yet. But when you read the historical side, you read about these women writing, right? You, you know that they wrote poetry, that they were these accomplished, educated figures. And then when you go to the literature side, where is their writing? Um, it's, it's not being assigned in your survey courses, really. You're seeing more men writing about women than the actual women's writing. And so the Devonshire answered that. And that is where my work tries to um, tries to expand our view of what Henry Shin Court literature was. So in my work broadly, I'm pulling on work in women's writing. I'm pulling on work in communal manuscript writing. And I'm trying to put that together to contribute to this new and emerging view of Tudor court literature that basically assumes that most writing is communal to some extent. And I, I am defining that really broadly and hopefully we'll get a bit of a picture of that as we go through some of the specifics. But that, that means that most authorship isn't masculinized because it's not singular. Um, and so it can't occupy a sort of single position in that way. So my book tries to use that emphasis to revisit first some of that more canonical work by men authors. Now you can make an argument that Tudor court poetry itself isn't terribly canonical anymore, but you know, Thomas Wyatt, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, the sort of big names. And then I try to progress through these three outlets for communal reading and writing. So looking at how authors um, drew on traditions to make particular arguments, looking at how they worked in translation, um, and then looking at something that is really anchored in the Devonshire, and that's using transcription to actually make new points. So something that is copying a poem often isn't just copying a poem. And I'm hoping from that we can build a sense of a sign of different canon as we introduce these women writers into the same context as the male authors who are maybe already a little bit more studied. And we are going to talk about the Devonshire manuscript more, but before we do that, I, I wonder if you could expand on this idea of communal writing, because I find it so fascinating, actually. So you've already said that it's a, quite a common practice at the Tudor court. So tell us a little bit more about communal writing and reading as well. Absolutely. So first, really big picture definition. Um, part of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about communal reading and writing is just opposing that idea of the sort of single author in a tower, right? Um, that's not how anybody <laughs> writes. That's not how our writing gets done. But particularly at the Tudor court, manuscripts moved around so much. So Henry VIII himself was a part of this. Uh, Ray Siemens has some really cool work on the Henry VIII manuscript. Wyatt's manuscript collections are quite famous. So you have the Egerton, you have the Arundel Harrington, and you have the Blage, in addition to the Devonshire has sometimes been considered a Wyatt manuscript. But in those, poets are writing alongside each other. Um, and they usually aren't terribly concerned with marking things off as specifically theirs. Henry is a little bit of an exception, probably to no one's surprise. But Wyatt 
writes what he writes and other people write alongside him. In the Devonshire, there's no sort of distinction between, oh, this is the great Thomas Wyatt and this is somebody who's less important. The poems are just all in there, unattributed. So these manuscript collections were also often serving social functions. They served as collections that people might perform from, both in the sense of just reading poetry, but also very, very often they're lyrics that are meant to be set to music. We don't always know what music, but we often know that they were meant to be set to music. And they could be competitions. John Skelton characterizes some of his work as a public flighting, where he's in some kind of competition with another courtier at Henry VIII's command to to show off. And they could be exchanges, both conversational, and gift exchanges. Um, Alexander Day and uh, Jane Donaworth have some really good work on manuscript passing as gift work. But also, you know, you might jot something down in a manuscript that you share with your friend as a kind of mark of, of notice for them. And I think there are a couple of famous examples that listeners might already be familiar with. Catherine Parr, of course, very famously arranges for the creation of and the distribution of manuscript versions of some of her texts. And then I suspect Elizabeth is picking up a little bit on that when she creates copies of texts or translations of texts to give her father and her stepmother. So showing off learning, yes, but also saying, I have taken care in writing this because I thought it would be of interest to you. Absolutely. And and also, let's talk a little bit about the role that women played. We talked a little bit about Wyatt and some of the other men. But what role did women play in not just the creation of these manuscripts, but also that circulation and passing on that you've been talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I am, I'm going to pull forward a bit that idea of these kinds of gift networks. And I want to acknowledge that that isn't gendered in a way where it means only men do this or only women do this. Certainly men give gifts in the Tudor court, but it is a social language to which women I think are particularly attuned in the period. So there's an element that applies regardless of gender, but that with the Devonshire, it does seem to be women who are doing it, where it's just the movement of the manuscript from one space to another. We don't know a great deal about everywhere that the Devonshire manuscript might have been, but we have a good you that it ends up with Margaret Douglas um, after she's established a household independent of the court because her son writes what appears to be the latest entry in it. Then there's also, though, an element that I think is more inflected by gender for women, partly because I think gender is taking on new inflections in the period. And I think Henry himself is, is part of that. He's creating an atmosphere through his marriages um, and other decisions where the fact that you are a woman can destabilize your class position. And I think previous to this period, class position really, really takes precedence in a lot of cases, not all the time. And certainly it's complicated by gender. But Henry has created an atmosphere where a queen is no longer, that's no longer a stable social position. So I think that means that women have to think about these gift networks and transmissions of critiques and things differently, because they're increasingly needing that communal power, rather than continuing to have access to the more traditional legal recourses and positions. And then that responsive element in the communal writing network partly becomes about building solidarity in this sort of more unstable position. So while there are parts of the Devonshire particularly that feel a little bit more co-equal in how people are writing, I think particularly by the time of Henry's death, we see women looking more specifically to other women for how do I write? What do I write? And then this is a little beyond not just what we want to talk about today, but frankly, what I study. But I just want to acknowledge the great work that is out there. Another identity position that becomes particularly marked by transmission of communal writing is fringe religious positions or religious positions that are losing um, favor in in official networks. Yeah, I have to say the theme of of women's networks in particular has come up quite quite a lot recently in different (laughs) kinds of episodes talking about different things. But I suppose the one takeaway that I've gotten from it is just how vital they were to women in this period, how important as well. And it's just interesting that they sort of keep popping up. So it's such a, a fascinating area of research, I think. I'd like to talk a little bit more now specifically about the Devonshire Manuscript. So there may be people that have never heard of it. So would you mind just telling us a little bit more about what it actually is, what it contains, and who those main contributors actually were? 
Absolutely. Um, so the Devonshire is a verse um, miscellany from the 1530s and early 1540s, mostly. I mentioned a moment ago that Margaret Douglas's son does, does make a later entry, but most of it is 1530s, early 1540s. It's compiled by Henry Courtiers. The social edition, which is a very cool online resource that I may mention again later, it catalogs 194 items. I think you could get to quite a range on that number, depending on what you want to count. So on a single page, we might have stanzas from three different poems, and then we might have annotations in the margins where people are either commenting on them or they are marking out some kind of relationship to people at court. Lots of scholarly argument on what those marks are supposed to indicate. In some cases, we're quite confident it's not authorship. In other cases, whether it could be authorship has caused a lot of argument. And then I actually even like the, the first page just had some sort of like little doodles. Um, I shouldn't actually dismiss them as doodles because we all know how much they loved symbolism um, and put little messages into their images. But 194 items-ish, ranging from marks of a name to full poetic entries. In most recent scholarship, you're going to see the women treated as the major contributors. And so that's Mary Fitzroy, who's Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey's sister, um, married quite briefly to Henry VIII's son, Henry Fitzroy. Mary Shelton, and then Margaret Douglas, Henry VIII's niece um, and a very, very powerful person at court. And then with the connection to Douglas, the other person who were very sure as a contributor, is Thomas Howard. And so Margaret Douglas and Thomas Howard contracted a fairly disastrous marriage in 1536, right around, it was discovered right around the time of Anne Boleyn's execution. They were both sent to the tower. Margaret Douglas was ultimately allowed to move to an abbey. She was released the following year, just before Thomas Howard died of an illness in the tower. So I, I mention in the book that there's a lot of speculation that Henry VIII actually intended to forgive them, but he ran out of time. Circumstances did not allow. So it's hard to say exactly how the Devonshire started or what the earliest entry is, but a lot of its importance, I think, to us and to the courtiers at the Henrician court comes from these anchoring sections around that Douglas Howard affair or marriage. Um, there are also definitely lighthearted sections where there's a little bit more sort of courtly flirtation, but the Douglas Howard exchange is a key part of the manuscript, and some entries do feel really necessarily colored by their proximity to verses that are very clearly about, about this affair. Yes, and we're going to talk more about their interactions in the manuscript because I think that's quite fascinating. But I just wanted to know, Rebecca, in terms of the actual physical manuscript is this something <laughs> that people were adding sort of leaves to as they went or how do, do you have information on that um I do I feel bad I'm not sure I'm going to be able to cite the person oh, uh the, the the book history person who put this forward but we do think that it from the first entry existed in its current form if that makes right. yeah sense um that it was all one text and that's part of what I explore in terms of how we read things relative to each other is that it isn't a case where maybe someone flips to the back and, and adds something, right? Like adds a new section. But instead that if someone chose to enter something at the end, they knew that they were doing that in the physical book because there are quite a few, I guess I shouldn't say quite a few, but a reasonable number of blank pages still mm -hmm. as well. So placement is a, it's a choice that courtiers are making. It's um. It's a medium-sized book for the period um, and convenient for me as a researcher because I neither have to uh, sort of look, you know, get out get out the magnifying glass on something really, really tiny um, or have to lug around something huge. Um, but it is on the larger side, which actually makes it a lot easier to read the early modern paleography in it. And has it been digitized? Yes. It it has, has. Hasn't it? So I mentioned a second ago that social edition of the Devonshire. Yes. Um, an absolutely phenomenal resource. So you can, at least in the US, but I would think in the UK as well, um, just Google a social edition of the Devonshire manuscript and it comes up and it is all transcription of the original 
spelling, um, then alongside that are facsimiles of all of the pages. So while I don't know that it has exactly the same impact as um, I think I think you particularly will empathize with this, um, that feeling when you touch something and you're like, Margaret Douglas definitely touched this. A lot of scholars believe that Anne Boleyn touched this. But I still think seeing their handwriting on the page is a pretty exceptional experience. It's also, for me, a fun challenge. I, I put images from it in front of my students quite often when they tell me that they think I won't be able to read their handwriting. <laughs> um, because if I can read Tudor paleography, I can read your handwriting. Um, but it can be a fun challenge to sort of pose yourself to look at the transcription and look at the writing and see how much of it you can figure out. That's fantastic. I love that. I'll be doing that. Definitely. And and obviously, you just mentioned Anne Boleyn there. These are, you know, the period that it was written, if it's in the 1530s, this is Anne's time, obviously, as queen. Is there any suggestion or possibility that she, you know, you've said perhaps she handled it, but she, she definitely didn't contribute to, to it, did she? Definitely is a little stronger than we're comfortable going with. This, oh, this good. Is an okay, that's good. Scholarly conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm not comfortable with definitely. I think we don't know enough to even go as far as probably wow. um, but there are if you if you check out the social edition you would be able um listeners would be able to see some of the areas that have been considered as as having some relationship to um Anne's work so it, it's you know it's an ongoing frustration that we don't have anything that we can clearly and definitely say yes this is her poetry and I'm confident of it, but there is speculation that some of the work in the Devonshire might might be hers or might be related to work of hers or things, those sort of tentative, tenuous connections we try to build. So let's talk, let's go back to Margaret Douglas and Thomas Howard. They've interacted in this manuscript. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how they did this and, and maybe what it meant? Yes. Um, so I mentioned, you know, the Devonshire is something we can have a lot of arguments about in the field. And so um, on the how... Uh, I will go ahead and own that in the book, I propose that Mary Shelton copies out. Um, I don't propose, I'm not the first person to propose this, but that's sort of the, the position I'm taking, that she copies out an, an epistolary exchange between Thomas Howard and Margaret Douglas. Other scholars have disagreed. They think that um, perhaps the book itself was transmitted. But what we definitely do have is epistolary verse exchange. And by that, I mean poems that are letters between the two lovers. So they also do some neat things. Um, Thomas Howard does a lot of work with uh, what I'm going to call Chaucerania. That is, some of it's by Chaucer, some of it isn't, but it was all in the Tyne edition of Chaucer. And so he will manipulate verses so that they say something complimentary about women rather than something negative about women. Um, or in one of my favorite passages, he tweaks a poem by leaving a blank space where the beloved's name should be. So where it should be Crusada. He takes that out, or Cressida for those of us who are early modernists. Um, he takes that out, but he doesn't put Margaret's in. He just leaves it blank. But then in the verse exchange, they really are going um, back and forth. And I would say they're doing a few things. They're performing this kind of defense. We contracted this treasonous marriage. We understand. We're sorry. But it really is because we are really in love. Look, look, we're showing you. Really, we're in love and we did this for the right reasons. They're also reassuring each other and thinking about, I think, how best to pull off this defense. There are passages about sort of keep your chin up. There are passages where they are reaffirming their fidelity to each other. And then they are also just communicating with this person that they are still somewhat freshly in love with. So one piece that I love is that in these epistolary exchanges, they share this beginning of line repetition in some poems that Douglas continues to use after Howard's death. So either that's something that they are echoing back to each other, or it's something that one of them learned from the other or is picking up as something that the other really likes like oh well I know you like this poetic form so I'll write this verse in that style for you so in that way it's a really touching record you know we can never we can never know what people felt in the early modern period but if we want to read it as evidence of this sort of very genuine love I think that's available 
And so talk to us a little bit more about how these love lyrics that you've been talking about, and of course, just the poetry in general, were actually used as political critiques at court. Yeah, so that's kind of the core. Um, when I say position taking in the title of the manuscript, is I think most verses are about expressing some kind of position relative to what is happening in the court. So I'm going to actually go back to um, that, that bit of defense that I mentioned in Douglas and Howard's verse to give an example. There's a portion I particularly like where Howard kind of gives the king an out. They do this in a few places, but the one that I'm particularly thinking of right now is he says, we we loved with no intent of giving offense. And then our love is one that good people would be sympathetic to. And so he gives Henry a chance to say, okay, you did the wrong thing, but you've admitted it. And I am going to put on my sort of benevolent king hat, my benevolent king crown, um, and forgive you. And that's something that we see other poets do as well. Um, Wyatt does this quite often in his poetry, and Elizabeth does this in some of her translation work as well. They'll give us a figure of, in their, in both of those cases, specifically a king who is making some kind of mistake, but they give Henry an option to get out of that characterization, a path that he could take to prove that he's not like that. And then on the far side of that, completely opposed to those sort of uh, opportunities for Henry to redeem himself, you have someone like Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. Um, I don't know how many listeners will have read The Assyrian King in Peace with Foul Desire, but if you haven't, you absolutely should. It's very easy to find online. And that's um, the Assyrian king in peace with foul desire. It is hard to imagine that anyone could have read this poem and not immediately thought that Henry Howard was writing about Henry VIII, particularly in a court that was used to using references to classical kings and biblical kings as a way of talking about the current king. And it is astonishing how absolutely suicidally angry and mean the poem is. Um, Howard must have felt very secure in his class position to have written a poem like this. And so those are just a few precedents that um, are established for the use of poetry in this way. All these examples are about kings. But what I'm saying more largely is that there are these traditions that are understood as ways you're allowed to express these arguments. That poem of Howard's was never used as evidence in his treason trials, ultimately. Um, and courtiers actually view engaging those traditions and engaging in critique as an important part of their role, as part of what defines them socially. And so my argument in the book is just essentially that there are certain forms, references to certain kinds of tradition, like kings, classical precedent, um, the use of translation, and these transcribed passages that really encourage um, a courtly Henrician audience to think, oh, this probably has something to say that is larger than the specific topic on the page. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And so in terms of the role of, of women authors in this particular manuscript, how does it allow us to reconsider certain aspects of the men's writing? So for me, there are really two key interventions that restoring women to their accurate place in the canon enables. And um, first, in the case of early modern writers, it really, really drives home that writing is not a solo activity. Second, then, um, it encourages us to remember that gender doesn't mean women. <laughs> um, I think we're making strides on this, but I do think that there is still a bit of an assumption that when we say gender studies, we mean women's studies, which actually itself just reinforces a masculine default. So courtier was a political position that was occupied by women and by men. And then one of the reasons the Henrician period is very important to me is because of that rise of the printing press, well established, we've all we've all talked about it, right? Um, this is a period where we get a concept of single authorship that then also gets masculinist. So I'm going to push us forward a little bit um, and just in light of the many activities this year around it, talk very quickly about the first folio as a great example of this. Um, so we know that Shakespeare's writing was more collaborative, right? Um, we also know enough about how plays get produced to know that that kind of writing is always going to be more collaborative. But the first folio takes this very clear position of the authorizing voice here is Shakespeare, the author, who is a man. That echoes back, though, 
to collections in the 16th century. So a lot of work that was in the Devonshire also ended up in Toddles, which is a famous miscellany collection from the period. And Toddles helped shape the canon for literary study. Really quite recently, all of the Henrician poets in the Norton Anthology, which is among the most common used in the United States at universities, had also been named in Toddles. So there was like a very direct link there. And the name part is important that he named these authors. In my field, we call it Toddles, but the actual title of the collection is Songs and Sonnets of the Right Honorable Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. The others, um, they get tacked on there, right? So Toddle is picking up on this authorizing name. The Tyne edition of Chaucer that I mentioned Howard is working from had done the same thing. Even though it does seem like at the time, they seem to have known that not everything in that edition was Chaucer Chaucer. It was more in the style of or in the flavor of Chaucer. But that authorizing na name then actually kind of erases the communal product. And so when we go back to the Devonshire manuscript or the other manuscript collections that Toddle has to be pulling from or that Toddle is getting works taken from and then brought to him, we rediscover that communal product which then means we have to challenge this view of our literary history as primarily one of single-authored, male-authored texts, and certainly of the male as a sort of standard gender for a person moving and writing in the Henrician world, which then means that certain assumptions, like that men particularly chafed at service, and that's why they use feminizing language around it, well, what if that poem is actually by a woman um, and her chafing there is at least as much about class as it is about particular gendered expectations? We just have to be so much more careful than we sometimes are about reading backward what are really sort of Victorian assumptions about gender that we've then taken on in the modern world, too. Yeah, so much food for thought. My brain's just <laughs> going into overdrive thinking of all the things. So we, you've talked about, of course, Mary Shelton, Margaret Douglas, Mary Fitzroy, but there were other women in this period who were who were also writing. Uh, for example, Catherine Parr, that probably lots of our listeners know and have heard of her writing. So you want to do you want to tell us a little bit more about some of these other women that are producing work at, at, in this period? Absolutely. Um, so. I am also going to mention a couple of scholars here in connection um, with Catherine Parr, because Micheline White and Janelle Mueller have both looked at Parr's other literary influences. White has fantastic work on Parr's collaboration with Henry. So again, sort of thinking about if, if Henry is comfortable mixing gender in literary production, then probably everyone else is going to be comfortable with it as well. Um, and then it's Janelle Mueller who uses the specific term versicles to refer to some of Parr's literary output. And I think that term is so perfect. But then it lets us also think about who else is she writing with, in addition to these religious figures who are often men. The techniques that she's using are also common to verse production at court, where we definitely see that women are more involved. And so she is moving in both communities. And then Parr herself becomes such a sort of towering literary figure, right? Why, why wouldn't you want to be like the queen? That I think we definitely see young women at the Tudor court in those last few years, or in the Henrician court in those last few years, picking that up. Certainly not least her stepdaughters. But also someone like Jane Lumley, who I also um, talk about in the book, she's doing Greek translation work by 13, which is remarkable. And she also stays a very active member of later Tudor literary circles. So again, going back to that idea of networks, Parr's position as queen might in some ways isolate her, but her legacy then re-enters these reading and writing networks. So I think if I can pull Lumley back a bit, we can see her writing work as offering a really neat extinction of some of the ideas that we've discussed and that I'm that I'm interested in. First, Lumley definitely thinks she is allowed to write. So this idea that we encounter often of like, oh, women weren't allowed. Well, nobody told Lumley that. She's educated to do that. You know, at, at the age of 13, the only way she had access to those things is through her father's express authorization. So we're challenging some certain expectations there um, about what gendered assumptions were in the period. Lumley's name, I think, is not as well known as a lot of the other figures that we've talked about. Um, I think that applies to Mary Shelton. Somewhat shockingly, I think sometimes that applies to Margaret Douglas, who couldn't have been a more prominent person at the time. But that means we can see how much of the actual writing world 
isn't necessarily accessed in the popular imaginary around the period. And so then we see how much writing and reading was happening that we aren't really picturing when we picture early modern authorship. And then Lumley's own role in literary networks, in women's networks later, um, which Peter Davidson has some work on. And then um, also in some cool work by Alexandra Day, who I mentioned earlier on Gift Networks, she considers the Lumley family's own internal networks as these kind of literary networks. All of that invites us to think about reading and writing as communal practices, as areas where these authors are writing together, not just what they want to say um, as one person's unique perspective on things. Um, but instead, how can I take the material that's out there? Lumley translates um, Euripides, but she's clearly translating it from the perspective of, of a 13-year-old girl who is going to be invested in particular elements of the protagonist. So yeah, that's extraordinary. 13, my goodness. Um, <laughs> So going back to the, the the Devonshire manuscript for a moment, I was just wondering if if you could tell us a little bit about how this incredible treasure has survived all the centuries for us to now be able to look at it and study. Oh, goodness. I, I feel like a bad book historian right now um, because I'm not going to be able to trace the oh, provenance no, no. in the way that, a, <laughs> that an archivist would. But... I mean, essentially, private libraries is like our core answer here, right? Um, so the end of the end of Margaret Douglas's line is later than my period, but a series of sort of collapsing tragedies, right, one yeah. after another. Sorry, I should provide a little bit of context there for listeners. Her son is the Lord Darnley, who marries Mary, Queen of Scots, and then is murdered, and then they try to cover it up by blowing him up. And then also, uh, when her other son dies, she actually tries to get the estates transferred to her daughter-in-law, um, but isn't successful in that legal claim. Now, ultimately, this bloodline ends up with James, and so hooray, a win. Um, but um, he's he's not got watch a book historian will tell me I'm completely wrong about this, but I don't think he has any connection to the family libraries because he's been brought up not there, right? But for quite a while now, and I would have to look it up to be able to tell you what year, I'm afraid, but it is housed at the British Library now and mm -hmm. has been for some time. And so with, with a little bit of work and a little bit of um, support from appropriate background, um, you, can, you can see it and also engage with this thing that the Henrician Courtier is engaged with. Yes, I love that. I know it's it's so special being able to hold a manuscript from that period. And, and it's wonderful that we have digitization. I think that's extraordinary as well. But um, there's nothing quite like holding it is there and knowing that, you know, that kind of some of their DNA is on it. It's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. So the, the very last thing that I wanted to ask you, Rebecca, is about our Tudor takeaway. So this is something that I ask all my guests at the end of episodes, a little something for our listeners to go off and explore to, you know, something that perhaps will nurture their love of what you've been discussing. So I know I've mentioned it twice already, but um, it's absolutely got to be the social edition of the Devonshire. Um, I just think that it is so, so neat to have that completely free, entirely online, to have those facsimile images right alongside. Um, now, if listeners try it out and find that they're finding the transcription from early modern English too challenging, first, my recommendation is always just read it out loud. But from there, Elizabeth Heal does have a great modernized edition. And I think a great experience is to get Heal's modernized edition and read it alongside the transcription so that you can see some of what happens when we sort of stabilize it, but also so that those passages that you're struggling with, um, you're able to sort of look at and go, oh, okay, I actually, I actually do know that word. So I do think that the sort of real Tudor fans who are the people who are listening to Talking Tutors, right, are would appreciate both volumes alongside each other. And then it's just so cool to have the opportunity to both read it in the modern and then deepen your understanding through this additional resource. The social edition also has a lot of great scholarly work in the footnotes. So I know it's easy to overlook footnotes, but I think a lot of the most interesting stuff is, is really in, in there alongside the poems. I'll even I'll even recommend a specific Oh, um, Margaret Douglas's uh, Now That Ye Have uh, Be Assembled Here. So all of the poems are listed by first line. And that's one that we're pretty 
we're we're espousing we're arguing is a douglas original who can say really because also authorship kind of isn't entirely the point but certainly if we imagine it written in her voice uh, at the time that her uncle has been responsible for her husband's death it's a very striking poem and also mary fitzroy's version of oh happy dames that may embrace just because um her brother gets all the credit and i'd like us to look at mary fitzroy's transcription of the poem and just sort of think about how it sounds if we're if we're reading it in her voice instead of in his. Well, that's wonderful. You've given us so much to go off and explore. <laughs> and I'll definitely be checking out the, the social edition. And I love the sound of the modern edition as well by Elizabeth Hill, just to, to compare, compare and um, contrast. That's really wonderful. And this has been such a fascinating discussion. And I encourage anyone who's interested in learning, obviously, more to, to go to your book, Gender and Position Taking in Henrician Verse. Is there anywhere else online that they can follow your work, Rebecca? I do have a website, um, and that is R-M-Q-U-O-S-S-M-O-O-R-E dot com. Um, I am a quite a teaching hubby institution, so I'll be candid that that only gets updated about once a year. Um, but on my next update, I am going to put up um, a link to this. Uh, as well as to, I, I recently gave a talk at a neighboring institution, just that sort of thing. So that is the best place to find me. I am also on various social media at RM um, but that landscape keeps shifting, no? So uh, wherever we all are next, you can find me at that at that handle. Exactly. That is hard to keep track of, isn't it? <laughs> and I'll add a link to your website to the show notes to make that easy for our listeners. But thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk tutors with us. Thank you so much, Natalie. This has been an absolute pleasure. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tutors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetutortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tutors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.